Well, thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, it's, a, it's really nice uh, to uh, be able to uh, talk about the book with um, friends from my hometown here, State College and Penn State University. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, start out with a, an excerpt uh, from the book, uh, from the prologue of the book that I'll read. And then I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the book, my history, how I found myself at the center of um, you know, one of the uh, fiercest debates uh, in society today, the debate over climate change and what to do about it. Um, and sort of uh, what I've learned, or what I'd like to think I've learned, and, and lessons I can share from the experiences um, that I've had at the center of this debate. So uh, the excerpt that I'll read um, is uh, my attempt to sort of take readers um, uh, at the very beginning back to a particularly uh, memorable, uh, not in a good way, um, morning um, in my life, and, and to use that uh, to provide you some sort of a window into what it's like to be at the center of um, of fairly heated attacks by those who uh, uh, find in inconvenient in some way um, the, uh, the scientific findings that climate change is real. So on the morning of uh, November 17, 2009, I awoke to learn that my private email correspondence with fellow scientists had been hacked from a climate research center at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom and selectively posted on the internet for all to see. Words and phrases had been cherry-picked from the thousands of email messages, removed from their original context, and strung together in ways designed to malign me, my colleagues, and climate research itself. Sound bites intended to imply impropriety on our part were quickly disseminated over the internet through a coordinated public relations campaign, groups affiliated with the fossil fuel industry, and uh, other cl climate change critics helped catapult these sound bites onto the pages of leading newspapers and onto television screens around the world. A cartoon video ridiculing me and falsely accusing me of hiding the decline in global temperature was released on YouTube and advertised through a sponsored link that appeared with any Google search of my name. The video eventually made its way onto CBS Nightly News. Pundits dubbed the wider issue of the hacked emails ClimateGate and numerous investigations were launched. Though our, though our work was subsequently vindicated time and again, the whole episode was a humiliating one. It was unlike anything I'd ever imagined happening. Uh, I had known that climate change critics were willing to do just about anything to try and discredit climate scientists like myself, but I was horrified by what they had now, by what they had now stooped to. And my thoughts turned to an event from a decade earlier. Uh, in August 1999, I attended a meeting in Arusha, Tanzania, as a lead author for the upcoming report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. From my hotel room, I could see one of the world's great wonders, Mount Kilimanjaro, with its magnificent ice cap lying just degrees from the equator. The ice cap, by the end of the 20th century, had already shrunk to just a third of its area, um, a third of the area it covered in 1936 when Ernest Hemingway wrote The Snows of Kilimanjaro, but it was majestic all the same. After the meeting, I joined a day-long expedition to see one of the world's great displays of nature, Serengeti National Park. Here, zebras, giraffes, elephants, water buffalo, hippos, wildebeests, baboons, warthogs, gazelles, and ostriches wander among some of the world's most dangerous predators, lions, leopards, and cheetahs. Among the most striking and curious scenes I saw that day were groups of zebras standing back to back, uh, forming a continuous wall of vertical stripes. Why do they do this? An IPCC colleague asked uh, uh, the tour guide to confuse the lions. He explained, predators in what I call the Serengeti strategy look for the most vulnerable animals at the edge of a herd, but they have difficulty picking out an individual zebra um, uh, to attack when it is seamlessly incorporated into the larger group, lost in this case in a continuous wall of stripes. Only later would I understand the profound lesson this scene from nature had to offer me and my fellow climate scientists in the years to come. So let me step back a little bit now and, and talk uh, about my background. Um, I have uh, loved science from the earliest days that I can remember as a young boy. I was always fascinated by anything vaguely scientific. I used to pester um, the adults with questions about uh, the speed of light and uh, tornadoes and hurricanes. 
and just about anything that in some way related to the natural world. Um, and uh, I loved science. I, uh, in high school, um, I was one of those uh, science geeks, science nerds. Uh, and it, it is literally true that uh, my idea of a, a good time a, 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 on a Saturday night was hanging out with my other computer geek friends um, at school in the computer room working on interesting problems, trying to solve problems through uh, clever programming techniques and having pizza. And that was my idea of a fun Saturday night. It's a little pathetic, actually. Um, and I, interestingly enough, um, there's, a, there's a, a story that I recount in my book. Um, back in 1984, uh, after seeing the movie War Games, I suspect many of you have seen the movie, um, I became fascinated with this problem. So in, in the movie, um, they are trying to teach this uh, computer who's taken control of, uh, of, um, of uh, nuclear warheads, uh, trying to teach it the futility of war so it won't launch these warheads. And to do that, they need to uh, teach it about futility. And so they decide they need to get it playing itself in tic-tac-toe and learning from its mistakes so that it'll understand that you can't win a game of tic-tac-toe. The analogy being you can't win a, a, a global thermonuclear war. And it has profound implications for society and policy. It had nothing to do with why I was interested in it. It was a really cool uh, programming problem. How do you teach a tic-tac-toe game to learn from its mistakes? Uh, it involves artificial intelligence. Um, I set out to do this um, and spent a couple months, uh, actually that, that summer, um, tr trying to trying to solve this problem, and I used uh, a trick, a term that we use in science and math to denote sort of a clever uh, approach to solving a vexing problem, to get the computer to to learn how to um, uh, you know uh, learn from its mistakes, um, because it turns out that there's so many different moves that if you record every bad move, so every time the computer loses, you tell it not to make its way to the same position that it was in when it lost that game. And for, through that pro, uh, process, it'll eventually learn to become undefeatable. But it turns out that there are so many different moves that if you restore every configuration, um, at least with the computers we had back in the mid-1980s, the program gets so slow, um, it's just not uh, solvable. So the trick that I used was to recognize the symmetry of the problem. A tic-tac-toe board essentially looks the same whether you rotate it 90 degrees, 180 degrees, to 70 or 360 degrees, whether you flip it um, vertically or horizontally. And so it turns out, if you take it uh, into account that uh, symmetry, there are many fewer uh, moves that you have to store, um, board configurations that you have to store. Uh, so the term trick uh, would uh, be used um, later after these uh, emails were hacked. One of the uh, emails uh, that was uh, cherry-picked and taken out of context referred to um, uh, Mike's uh, nature trick. And what it was describing was um, a way of comparing Yet those, that, the, that word was used by our detractors um, to suggest that somehow climate scientists were trying to trick the public uh, about the problem of climate change. Um, and so this is, um, that's, that's the nature of the attacks that we've increasingly been subject to uh, because of uh, the, 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 our findings. in theoretical physics, uh, actually the, uh, what we call condensed matter physics, understanding the behavior of, of, of fluids, of uh, liquids and solids, um, and went off to graduate school at Yale University to study theoretical physics. Um, now this was the late 1980s now, and it was actually a pretty bad time to be getting into physics because they had just cut uh, the funding. Congress had just cut funding for the superconducting super collider, so suddenly there wasn't the massive investment in physics that we were all expecting. And you could no longer just work on any problem that you wanted. Um, and a, you, you couldn't necessarily work on the big picture problems, the sort of problems that had gotten me excited about going into physics in the first place. Um, we were sort of being funneled towards increasingly more applied areas of research. And so I sort of decided to take a step back and see if there was somewhere else where I could apply my math and my physics background to working on a big picture problem that really mattered. Um, and I saw that there were 
scientists down the hill from the physics department in the Department of Geology and Geophysics um, who were using math and physics to work